You're listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. Today we are joined by Dr. David Sweeney to discuss the OA, a genre-defying series created by Britt Marling and Zal Batmanglic. The OA premiered in 2016 and ran for two seasons before it was cancelled by Netflix, despite plans for a five-season arc. The series depicts a multiverse and an ensemble cast of characters who explore multiple layers of reality and identity, merging elements of science fiction, social drama, fantasy, and philosophy. Dr. David Sweeney is a lecturer in the Design History and Theory Department of the Glasgow School of Art, specializing in popular culture. He is the author of critical studies of the novels of Michael Marshall Smith, Subterranean Press 2022, the Netflix series The OA, author Liverpool University Press 2022, and a forthcoming publication on the films of Nicholas Winding Refn for Liverpool University Press. David Sweeney, thank you so much for joining us today for our After Images podcast episode number three. We're delighted that you're here to discuss the OA. It's a series that both Franck and myself really appreciate. Um, and we're looking forward to discussing with you because you have written a book about the OA for Constellations. Um, just jumping right in, could you tell us how you discovered the OA and also what inspired you to write a book about the OA? Okay, uh, so I came to the OA already being a fan of... Uh, Marlin and Batman Grigio's uh, film Sound of My Voice and uh, the, the other film that, that um, Brett Marlin had already made with Joe ha uh, Mike Cahill another director called Another Earth so both of those films are real favourites of mine, particularly Sound of My Voice and I enjoyed The East the, the second film that um, Marlin and Batman Grigio made so I was really um, kind of primed for the OA I found that you know that those films were remarkable, um, really kind of fresh and original. I think Batman Gleish is a great filmmaker. Marlon's a great actor. They're both great creators and, and writers. So yeah, I was thrilled when it was announced by by uh, Netflix. And I also you know was as well as having sort of academic eye on it. Um, I was just a fan. You know, I was I you know I, I kind of spread the word about it. I've got friends who. Um, hadn't seen any of the movies and then became fans of, of the series. So um, I had written um, an article for an American comparative literature journal called The Comparatist about um, the, the use of metalepsis in uh, the OA and the idea of, of um, which was quite prominent at the time when Trump was still in, in office, of um, tribal epistemology. You know the idea of fake news and and, and even more importantly of post truth. So I kind of applied that to the OA, um, but changed it to be like tribal ontology, um, and I also used Max Weber's ideas of kind of charismatic leaders. So the the article was um, quite well received, which made me think that there was enough interest to write um, a book about the OA. And I thought, who would publish it? And I'd read Lindsay Hallam's great book on Firewalk with me. I believe Lindsay's been a guest for you as well. Um, and was really impressed by Auteur's um, list, of, uh, both uh, The Devil's Advocate and Constellations. And got in touch with John Atkinson and very quickly he expressed an interest. I sent him a proposal and the, the book was written fairly quickly. It was interrupted a little bit by the pandemic. Um, but it was a real labour of love writing the book. Um, one of the things that I've found watching the movies and then the series was the, the, the influences upon them, drawn from um, kind of underground things like the John Titor myth created by Joseph Metheny, which is what Sound of My Voice is based on, and then the um, 
the uh, augmented reality game or alternate reality game rather the Jejun Institute which is a big influence on the OA very big influence on the OA um, so I, I find them both Marley and Batman Glees be fascinating um, creators um, both Frank and I have been on uh, the Aeon Byte podcast the Gnostic radio podcast and uh, Miguel Connor who's the host of that who's a big fan of the OA Again, you know, is greatly impressed by just how deep their knowledge of fairly kind of esoteric texts and ideas um, is, and I think that the OA also works so well because of its its beauty, you know, not just Brett Marling's beauty, but the the beauty of the whole kind of production. I think um, it really draws you in. I think it doesn't look like anything else that's on television. Um, and the cast, the ensemble cast were great. The ideas were great. And it just seemed to be something that would last and last and last until it didn't, you know. So um, when it was cancelled, I asked John if he still wanted to go ahead with the book. And he was adamant that we should, you know, that it that this was maybe a good point to actually write the book. Um, but we both discussed the possibility of it coming back, maybe in a different form. You know, maybe come back as a comic book, graphic novel, um, and it did seem as if something was brewing at one point, um, with the the kind of cryptic post that the Brett Marlin was putting up on Instagram. It seemed to be indicating that it was coming back, and then of course they announced the retreat with their new project instead. Um, so yeah, I think like you know that as niche as the OE is, I think it will have a second life later on. Um, and I'm glad, I'm honoured, in fact, to have written a book about it. Um, you've just mentioned um, Weber's uh, theory of the charismatic leader. Um, can you tell us in um, what way this relates not only to the OA, but to uh, former films uh, in which Brit Marling was playing and that she wrote? Yeah, well, uh, it, Sound of My Voice, which was originally conceived as a TV series, um, and as a lot of the ideas were then reused for for the OA, for those of you who haven't seen it, is about a cult in sort of present day um, Los Angeles, which is led by Marlon's character, Maggie, who claims to be a time traveler from, I think, 2054. So um, she is, and, and Britt Marlon is a very striking looking woman, she's a very striking actor. Um, so she is very charismatic. So, you know, I, I use Weber's ideas of the charismatic leader um, and how that forms an epistemology. Um, and, and, you know, an, a, a worldview for the followers of that leader. And then you see that repeated in the way as she, as Prairie Johnson, Marlon's character, who's a young woman who's been missing for like seven years, it was, is blind when she goes missing, but has regained her sight when she recovers, forms this group in the Crestwood suburb of in, in Illinois of um, mostly young men, but also one middle-aged school teacher who are drawn to her and sort of become, as they're later called, her tribe. You know, so um, there's a lot going on there in the sound of my voice about power and the exploitation of credulous people, because, of course, you know, we think that Maggie is lying. The, the way that the film is, is delivered is that her cult's been infiltrated by two documentary filmmakers, um, yeah, a, a couple, then the the man and the couple gradually begins to fall for for Maggie's charms, you know, for her charisma, um, and of course that, that's what happens in the OA as well. And there is the suggestion, particularly towards the end of the first season, that that Prairie is lying, that she's um, that she's using all these texts that she's gathered or discovered in her room. It's very like the the end of um, the Usual Suspects. You know where verbal Clement is revealed to have been making up the story from all the different things in the, the policeman's office, but then of course that's completely flipped in the second season. So the the whole kind of notion of of Prairie as this charismatic leader was fascinating to me because Brett Marlin in interviews would talk about how um, concerned she was about the way that young men stalled themselves, and particularly in America and. Um, you know, and she kind of felt that there was something that the the OA could contribute to discussions about masculinity. 
Um, and I think she is. I mean, I quite easily see Brett Marlin get into politics, you know, um, very easily get into politics. Um, but she, she does have that, that great charisma as an actor, you know, as a, an on-screen presence. And her, if you watch The East, um, you know, she joins another cell, an anarchist cell, infiltrates it as a kind of corporate espionage investigator and falls for the charismatic leaders of that cell. You know, so this is something that seems to be um, a preoccupation with, with her and with Batman Glees, you know, about how um, leaders operate and, and what that means for the individuals who um, are led by these figures. Um, so I think the OE raised a lot of, of interesting issues about that, which are very relevant to the internet age as well. You know, like, and the rise of, I mean, the term wasn't really around when the OE was on, uh, but the rise of the influencer, you know. So um, recently we've seen Andrew Tate be arrested along with his brother. And there's a lot in the British press um, at the moment like on the BBC about how to kind of deprogram young men from Andrew Tate's influence. You know, and school teachers are, are taking this very seriously. So, you know, regardless of what you think about Andrew Tate, he is a charismatic leader figure. Um, and I mean, I've always found that phrase influencer to be quite sinister, you know, um, sort of brainwasher. Why not use that one instead? So, you know, I think, you know, with the, the kind of strong internet um, fan base for the OA, sometimes, you know, it does come across as people who are maybe confusing um, Brett Marlin for the character of Prady Johnson. But Prady Johnson also kind of struggles with her the you know the cliche of great power and great responsibility, right? You know, so she um and I think ultimately the the idea was that in, you know, she said that she wants to create fiction that has either multi protagonists or no protagonists, you know, a new model, a new kind of narrative model. Um and I think the idea was in the the way that um you would see that happening with her tribe, that they would all become empowered you know, so she wouldn't be this sort of single uh, leader thing. Um, although, of course, the way that, that television, even, you know, kind of online television works, is it's still based around charismatic stars. So whether or not, you know, that would have been, um, it, it, that would have been feasible, I mean, well, we'll never know now, you know, so. But yeah, yeah, so that's that's something I think that they're very interested in. They're interested in the dynamics of power. In, in peer groups and um, and things like that. And it's so interesting, this new model that she proposes of multi-protagonists. And I think that in most of the film projects that she's been involved on, involved with, there's at least a small ensemble cast. So that's very true that um, we can really identify a number of important characters and, and different actors who fill those roles. And at the same time, it's always interesting to see the leading role that she takes on in many of the productions. And she's spoken a lot about the representation of women in a Hollywood landscape and how at one point she grew frustrated with auditioning for Bikini Girl number three yeah. in horror films and that she was really looking to create more meaning with her writing, with her production and her own acting. And I'm just wondering how the alternative model that she proposes for both female representation and roles, as well as this idea of ensemble casts with multi protagonists. How does that fit into the current television landscape? Do you think that viewers were ready for that? And also what role does the streaming, um, the streaming platform, what, do, what role does that play in, in this possibility? Well, I think the problem is, is that all the kind of major streamers have got very cautious. You know, and and actually, you know, have made backward steps. So you know, the phrase that you're hearing um, is elevated broadcast television. You know, so it, the the kind of experimental days seem to be over, and that they're erring on the side of caution, which is you know an inevitable result of market forces. But um, or was it inevitable? You know, maybe you know they could have been more bold. I mean, if you look at something like um, Servant on Apple TV, which is, I don't know if you've watched that, Evan Night Shyamalan's um, TV show, 
It's yeah. great. It's going to its fourth, I think, final season. It's an ensemble cast that, again, deals with um, power dynamics and charismatic, particularly charismatic women, right? Um, Reffin's new TV series, Copenhagen Cowboy, deals with that centering on one mysterious individual, a, a, a young woman, who at the end, not to kind of spoil anything, seems to move into this multiple protagonist, you know, kind of world, right? Um, but I think it, it's, I mean, as I say in the book, it's not as if multiple protagonists is new. You know, I mean, ensemble casts um, have been around for a long time and, you know, are actually a hallmark of prestige or quality television and have been for decades. But I think what... I mean, one of the most significant things about the OA was having a transgender character played by a transgender actor who has become, you know, an advocate for trans rights and, you know, a very kind of iconic figure. Now, um, you know, that that representation was long overdue and you weren't the first to do it, Sensei did it as well. And I think, you know, she's very sensitive, but my is very sensitive to the power that, that you have. Um, and obviously at the moment, and it's a culture, there's so much about the responsibility that pop culture has, you know, in terms of its audience and um, and whether or not that actually impedes the the kind of artistic freedom of a work of, of art, you know, of a, a narrative work. Um, but it would be fascinating to see what, how the OA would have progressed, that, you know, if... Prairie had taken a backseat if, you know, given what happens at the end of the second season where it appears she's dead, or at least close to death. Um, you've seen th- that in things like Buffy, though, you know, Buffy season five or season six when Buffy dies. Um, so I think there is an, an, certainly an interest in kind of character dynamics that as, what we, an ensemble cast doesn't necessarily have to be a supporting cast. You know, that but, and I do think audiences have got the patience for that. I just don't think that the streamers have got the uh, courage for it, you know. So what was interesting about the OA was that when it was, you know, there seemed no hope of any form of return of it, the fans made their own movie, you know, which has got quite high production values for a fan production and does deal with this idea of multiple protagonists. You know, a lot of the OA fan fiction deals with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see even with, like, you know, the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe, it's all about the Avengers, all about one big team, and you can be fans of individuals of the team and so on. Um, but I don't really see that much of this is actually happening at the moment. I mean, 1899 had an ensemble cast and lots of different intrigues and things going on. Um, you know, and then, the, you know, the plug was pulled on it. So it really comes down to either or maybe both, you know, streamers being more adventurous or be more adventurous in the way they used to be or, or fans doing stuff for themselves, you know, which might send a message to the streamers that people are not, they don't want this so-called elevated broadcast television, which is just a stupid phrase to say like you're getting, you know, the same old stuff that they dished out to you for years. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, again, this is the frustration of the OE finishing. It promised so much. And, you know, the the new project, The Retreat, um, is another ensemble project, you know. Um, it seems like a sort of post-Knives Out type who done it, um, And I hope that they put you know, their own kind of unique spin on that um, and that they aren't just playing that safe either. I hope, I doubt, I doubt they will, but um, yeah, I think audiences you know, rightly feel let down by streamers and, and networks and I think, they, you know, they just have to make their voices heard. Um, and maybe this is just a phase that, you know, a kind of reaction to the market being full of all these different streaming services that are in competition with each other. You know, maybe once things calm down a little bit, there'll be room again. Um, that happened in the comics industry a few years. There'd been times of innovation and then you know, things would become quite kind of conservative for a while and then it would it would happen again, you know. Um, so I'm always optimistic about, about these things on one hand, but I kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of streaming wars, as they've been called, are no surprise to anybody. Once, you know, Netflix's success was recognised for what it was, 
it was inevitable that all you know all these different TV stations would bring it in house and start to compete for audiences. Um, which is a shame because you know at one point Netflix you find all this great stuff on there, you know stuff from around the world. You know not just there's a lot of great Asian horror and European horror on and Indian horror on on uh, Netflix. But my my kind of fear is that all those kind of different international markets start becoming quite standardised mm-hmm. in order to survive, and you just get you know a sort of global model that's you know, that lacks any kind of diversity. And in terms of um, storytelling and uh, and narrative, yeah. yeah my, my feeling, I, I don't know if you will agree with this, but uh, um, is perhaps that streamers have a problem with ambiguity. Uh, it seems to me that DOA is um, very much about transitions. It's very um, uh, unclear what the meaning that uh, viewers uh, are supposed to get from the show. E- even actually, when you talk about charismatic leaders, because I mean, we, we've seen the, the dark side of this. I mean, the, uh, the dictator uh, sort of character that comes from this uh, use of um, of speech and charisma but on the other hand there's also uh, the beauty of storytelling that is at the root of the OA uh, so it remains ambiguous this um, it's always a, a dichotomy and they don't really clearly say which way we're supposed to go in the OA do they oh of course I mean you can easily see um you know Prairie's character being corrupted by power or you know you can see all these different points of tension coming in. Um, it's not as simple as, you know, Hap being the Darth Vader and her being Prince Leia or something like this. Um, but the ambiguity that you mentioned, absolutely, you know, streamers seem to have really backed away from that um, for a very kind of Manichaean representation of these kind of struggles. And again, I don't think that's what all viewers want. I mean, you know, the, the kind of puzzle TV shows that, like 1899, you know, which I, I see as a sort of post-OA television show, um, rely upon ambiguity and, you know, rely upon not just cliffhangers, but, and you know, a kind of real, you know, kind of slow-burning development of of the enigma of the series, that kind of thing. Um, and I was kind of really surprised that that was cancelled after one excuse me, one season, given um, how perfectly, you know, produced it seemed to be for an easily identifiable market. And given the fact it was the, the people who made Dark, you know, which ran for three seasons and was, you know, again, you know, sort of like exquisitely crafted. So I don't know that maybe what it'll be the usual kind of like market research that's identified a majority audience, which is not maybe not as committed or passionate an audience as um, you know, you know, the people who go on the Reddit pages for the OA or Dark or eighteen nineteen or something like this, and in order to kind of you know keep the shareholders happy or whatever, that's who is being targeted. But again, I always think back to you know the success of Twin Peaks in the early nineties, you know when. There was nothing like it. And, you know, people, it was appealing across the board. It wasn't just for Lynch fans. It wasn't just for, you know, kind of uh, esoterica fans. You know, it was a mainstream success, a pop culture phenomenon. And then, of course, the second season where Lynch's hands not as friendly on it becomes sort of like a parody of itself until he returns and takes over. But you got all these kind of attempts to spin off from, uh, or to imitate rather, um, Twin Peaks, none of which had the same sense of mystery and intrigue. And really, the, the, the thing that influenced the most was the X-Files. And the X-Files, as much as I loved it, was pretty straightforward in its narrative. You know, um, um, it really, it got, it got by on the kind of tension between the two leads, you know, the kind of romantic tension between the leads, and, and the fact it was very well made. So I think this is another example, quite a depressing an example of, um, you know, street well, you know, kind of studios or corporations or whatever underestimating their audiences, um, which you would have thought, you know, by now they had learned is always a bad idea. But you know, I mean, if you do, we want just another sort of mediocre, kind of pale imitation of 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 things. 
I don't think actually anybody does. I think, you know, the, the I don't think anybody really wants that. They might settle for it. I don't think anybody really wants it. Um, and I think there is a market for more um, engaging and absorbing and challenging um, shows and, and movies. Um, but whether or not there's the money for that, that's the that's the real problem. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting, of course, that the um, uh, sound of my voice was made on a micro budget as initially a web TV series that they couldn't afford to do, so it became a film instead, which was really their calling card because it's such a remarkable movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could quite easily have seen them go sort of independent after. The always cancellation. I don't know who's financed the retreat or where it's going to be shown. Um, you know, but they came from quite a kind of DIY, you know, again kind of almost like punk background um, approach towards these things, and that's what these industries need. It's the same way the comic industry needs them, the music industry needs them, fashion needs them. You know, otherwise you do just get this very sort of mediocre, um, mainstream uh, fodder that. I don't think anybody's really satisfied. But. It seems to me that um, you were mentioning Twin Peaks. Um, shows like Twin Peaks, The OA, they leave a lot of room for the audience, for the fans to appropriate the material themselves because there is mystery, because there is ambiguity. When someone is telling a story that is too straightforward, you watch it once and then you forget about it because you're kept at a distance, aren't you? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean... Um... With um, with with Twin Peaks with the OA, it's. I mean, you could look at Twin Peaks and say, okay, well, it's you know, broadcast television. So, it, it what's the main narrative device it's going to use? It's the cliffhanger, you know. So, but that wasn't the only, or even the main narrative device that um, Twin Peaks used. There were lots more kind of layered and nuanced ways of creating enigma and intrigue amongst audiences right you know so cliffhangers are just the kind of standard thing that audiences expect between episodes and they're you know without them they're they're only really noticeable when they're not there you know so all the other kind of layers of ambiguity and and, and intrigue in in Twin Peaks is what kept people watching and re-watching um Twin Peaks and talking about it not and this is like pre-internet you know this was like water cooler television before you know, you had the web to go and talk about things. And a lot of it is about pacing, you know, and about about trusting your audience and not insulting your audience's in- intelligence. So it's, it's interesting, you know, with um, Refn's new TV show and with his previous TV show, Too Old to Die Young, they're both really slow. And Refn, you know, deliberately makes his work slow as a, a narrative strategy that is engaging and absorbing. You know, and he's talked about with this new se- uh, new series, he uses a lot of 360-degree pans, uh, which are very slow, um, because he feels that you know, people are losing their ability to pay attention to things, right? And with a market that is full of competing streamers and competing content, use that horrible word, then, you know, you might think that to become slow is to commit sort of commercial suicide, but actually it creates an opportunity for people to be absorbed rather than just propelled by, you know, the, those kind of narrative codes, you know, that are you know, there that are built on suspense, you know, and built on a very kind of crude type of suspense, which is you don't know what's going to happen next until you watch the next episode, right? Mm-hmm. Which, but if you create a more sort of nuanced and layered form of audience engagement where people puzzle over things and I don't mean puzzle in sort of Sudoku or crossword puzzle kind of way, I mean like to really engage with this ambiguity that you mentioned, you know, to think about um, you know, what is what is the kind of metaphysics of the fictional world that you've gone into and, you know, who are these characters that you're engaging with, who is good, who is bad, you know, is it a question of this um, and that you know kind of creates um a, a t- or, or stimulates a form of viewing which is um you know what Roland Bart would call writerly you know it's very active engagement with what is going on now I think part of the problem as well is the way that fan culture became mainstreamed 
um, in the 2000s, you know, and became very much about a sort of public display of enthusiasm and, you know, of consumption, like, you know, wearing T-shirts or having avatars and all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, the fandom went from being something that was very kind of marginal and, you know, kind of ridiculed, actually, to being something that you were expected to do in terms of being an interesting person. And I think the um, the uh, content, again, to use that horrible term, that was distributed to people is is there to, that is to facilitate a consumption that can be displayed, right? You know, you can, you can hop onto Reddit and talk about, you know, the latest episode of whatever it is you've watched in a way that, satisfies this need to display yourself as an interesting committed person um whereas and, and to do so very quickly right whereas you know something like twin peaks of the oa or reference series require not just one watching but a re-watching which is a lot easier to do of course these days than it was before the web and a kind of um writerly engagement you know to use that, that phrase from bar where you which is actually much more rewarding and stimulating than just waiting for all to be revealed, you know? I mean, all was not revealed at the end of Twin Peaks The Return, you know? So, um, and who would want it to be, right? You know, like for, for, you know, there is an online video, I'm sure you've watched it, quite, you know, engaging where somebody solves Twin Peaks, you know? And you're like, well, well done, you know? So, you know, solved, you solved Twin Peaks. Um, and then you just forget about it, right? So, you know, like, that's... The, if you want there to be a solution to... I always compare these things to um, Pale Fire, you know, the Nabokov novel, which cannot be resolved. You know, there is no... And in kind of literary circles, it becomes a game where you decide that you're a shady or a Cambodian, that sort of thing. But you know it's a game because there is no way to solve that novel. And really, who wants to solve a novel anyway? I mean, that's, you know, as Bart says in The Pleasure of the Text, that's sort of, you know, bourgeois way of reading, um, which is just actually a form of consumption based on moving on to the next interesting thing that you can talk about to sound like an interesting person. You know, with the Twin Peaks in the way, that demands a certain sort of, like, obsessiveness with them, you know, um, which um, we should never undervalue, you know, like, it's and it, it that's you know what that kind of involvement with those texts is really stimulating and invigorating, you know, and does make you question all sort of the power dynamics of the relationships, not just between characters, but between you and the texts that you consume. You know, it's interesting the fan culture that you mentioned and this idea of consumerism and perhaps with this mainstream fandom, people looking for a really digestible material. Um, and it, it reminds me of how shocked I was when I discovered how much um, hatred the OA had attracted when I looked online for certain fan communities to see what kind of commentary was out there. It was interesting that not only did people dislike it, but they actually took the time to go to the OA's Facebook page and say everything that they hated about the series from, you know, it's nothing more than magical dance. I mean, as someone with a dance background, that was very upsetting to me <laughs> because that's one of my favorite aspects of the show. Um, but it was it was really interesting to see how many detractors there were and how detailed they were in in their criticism. Um, whereas I think that many of the elements they were complaining about are actually the very reasons that others who love the OA why yeah. they embraced the show. This idea of really taking a deep dive, and um, I know that you're very interested in Gnosticism, for example. So maybe could you tell us a little bit about? Um, this kind of precedent, I think, in shows like Twin Peaks, for example, this idea that a mystery is more than just a whodunit, but something a lot more metaphysical that is very internal. And why you think um, there is this divide, perhaps, between a minority of people who really love that and then others who just really um, feel quite repelled by that, I think. Well, I think it's just, you know, good old fashioned philistinism, you know, like that. You know that I mean the dance aspect of the OA is so easy to ridicule. You know that it's actually quite bold thing for them to have done. 
you know, to make himself as kind of um, as easy a target as that. Well, actually, if you stick with it, you know, the, the, the dance moves become so central to that world and its metaphysics and its, you know, the, the, the interaction between the characters. But that this is, you know, the, the kind of criticisms that Twin Peaks receive, um, that um, Refn receives, you know, that it's that it's arty, right? You know, or it's it's pretentious. That old word, you know, um, and that always says more about the person who's raising those claims than it does about the text that they're raising the claims against, right? You know, so it it's a kind of lazy. Um, you know, a, a lazy kind of cynical approach towards um, these texts, towards um, towards fiction, towards narrative, that really just speaks of a lack of imagination. And, and people want the people who make those kind of comments feel threatened by the OE or by by Twin Peaks. You know, by you know the the surreal, the genuinely surreal aspects of Twin Peaks, by the the genuinely gnostic elements of um, the OA, and you know, by the fact that that Lynch or you know Marlon Batman Glacier are bold enough to not just give you what you want, you know, or what you believe you want. Um, but of course, when people do feel threatened, now they just go online and lash out at other people. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the kind of detailed nature of those criticisms just prove that they must have watched the show or at least part of it. Um, and it's kind of disappointing that that still exists, but you know, the more that streamers and you, you know the, the people who work for them talk about content, the more the notion of art or the notion of of um, innovation or experimentation diminishes, and what you will end up with is just this you know widespread mediocrity, which will eventually turn audiences off because you know audiences it's so narratives are innovated from the the margins from the fringes you know there's there's the occasional sort of popular mainstream thing but even that will is the work of people who are looking outside of the mainstream you know so the mainstream needs its kind of um bold figures like Marlon and Batman Glees and some of the, you know, lynchings now a kind of cliche that you can use about things. Um, you see Refn's influence in a lot of different things now, but Refn's, again, makes himself a very easy target, but he doesn't care. And, you know, Lynch doesn't care, and, you know, Brett Marlon, Sal Batman Glees don't care. So, really, the, the pretentiousness, the artiness, without that, you just get the same mediocre stuff over and over again and eventually people get bored of that and if the cost of being you know innovative and experimental is to have some cynical jerk be mean about you online then i think you know that it, we can all handle that right you know so um but it's interesting like with stranger things you know the first season of stranger things i thought was very good indeed and you know, then it's been diminishing returns ever since with with Stranger Things, in my opinion. Um, but Stranger Things hinted at so much that it could have done that. Actually, I think its audience were primed for, were ready for, um, if it hadn't become such a kind of global phenomenon um, and such a marketing phenomenon. One of the things that that I think is really um, worrying about streaming is the death of physical media right you know so um out of you know the OA and um reference series that i've talked about um only stranger things has got physical media it's, you know and even then it's only the first two seasons that were released on dvd obviously twin peaks return got a dvd release but but a lot of these shows a lot of these movies don't have any existence beyond streaming so you know if streamers pull them then where are they unless they've been pirated after the batgirl film which was filmed here in glasgow after the batgirl, batgirl film was pulled by its studio there was a lot of discussion about um piracy as a form of archivism you know that this is a way of keeping these things alive 
And it worries me that, you know, I mean, the OA is still there. It's still on, on Netflix and it's on Netflix originals and it's re- they've only got rid of a few, very few of their own original productions. But um, if it goes, without it having been pirated by somebody, then, you know, it just fades into the memories of people like us who've watched it, you know. Um, and without that kind of physical media, without some sort of backup, then where does the next generation of makers get their ideas from, you know, if things disappear off the net? Um, so I would I would love there to be a physical release of the OA for that reason and for the fact that I just want to own it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we, we, we have already kind of entered a, a period of stagnation where there's things that are very kind of, you know, sort of cookie cutter versions of other things. Um, and that's why I think the, the cancellation of 1899 was such a surprise and another sign of worry, you know. But then Netflix does produce reference Copenhagen Cowboy series, which I can't recommend highly enough um, but which is completely unlike anything else that's on television mm. you know uh, or, or even on streaming surfaces you know or or surfing or, that i mentioned earlier on which is completely unlike anything else that's out there so you know we can undervalue these things at own cost if you don't like something that's fine but if you you know kind of scream and shout about how pretentious something is and, and how um you know, the other thing that tends to be thrown out is that, like, oh, it's just being made up as they go along, you know, which is completely untrue if you watch the aim. The, 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 the whole thing's been planned out meticulously mm. um, over those two seasons, pointing into where it would have gone after. When we did our second viewing, I know it was just incredible the, the amount of things that had been planted that we noticed the second time around that foreshadowed things to come. But, yeah, just to... um. To go back to what you were saying about physical media uh, and their disappearance, I mean, that, that somehow reminds me of 1984, uh, of the yeah. way uh, we are rewriting history and how we are saying, oh, that never happened. I mean, this is uh, totally made up. It's just in your mind, therefore it doesn't exist. Um, and, and the other comment I wanted to make was about um, the, the, the extreme responses that uh, on one side fans and on the other opponents of the show have i'm wondering if that's not once again uh linked to uh the ambiguity at the root of the of the um, uh, of the series and the fact that it is questioning the very nature of reality um uh, for a lot of people this is very destabilizing i think um to be put in a position to somehow take power you know uh to to be yeah, asked yeah to become part of the show. I mean, some will see this as something amazing, something that gives them a, a lot of freedom, and others will really be scared by that, won't they? Oh, absolutely, because, you know, amb- ambiguity means you run the risk of being wrong, mm-hmm. right? But that's only if you think that, that it's a choice between being right and wrong. You know, so I think this is the, the kind of... um this is the kind of unsettling power of ambiguity um, and about the way that, that that different forms of storytelling and different forms of narrative act upon people, you know, which does involve um, an element of surrender. It does involve an element of, um, of engagement. I'll give you an example from, um, from cinema, the, the horror movie It Follows. If you've seen that, right, which is a, a really hypnotic, mesmerizing piece of filmmaking. So I saw that in the cinema, um, in a multiplex cinema here in Glasgow. And in front of me, and you know, it was like a Saturday night, you know, and it was a, a packed out um, cinema. And there were two couples sitting in front of me who watched that movie in utter entranced silence. And then when it finished, it was as if a spell was broken. And they turned around to each other and said, that movie was terrible, right? And I could see them, they were glued to that screen, you know, but because it's such a slow, hypnotic movie that doesn't deliver a big payoff at the end, they felt unsettled, right? You know, as if being unsettled is a bad experience to have, right? You know, so I think this is what it comes down to. Like, you, What if you're wrong? What if you go online and you say that you like the wrong thing? Because so much of this kind of um, mainstreaming of fandom is about lifestyle, you know, and 
they also the way that you're encouraged to rate things online and to comment about them online. If you say the wrong thing, you make yourself vulnerable. If you, if you're not, I mean, over here in the UK, we've got the newspaper, The Guardian, which um, is good on its journalism, but it's kind of art reporting and its media reporting leave a lot to be desired because it is very much about um, lifestyle. You know that they approve things or they don't approve things, and then quite often you'll find uh, Guardian journalists changing their mind when something is, you know, taken on by an audience. And is and a perfect example of that is the OA, which was dismissed by the Guardian as being something like handsomely mounted rubbish, right? You know, um, and that's very much the sort of like kind of quite a middle brow approach towards things. That's the way that the Guardian has gone, right? So it is about having the right opinions about the right things that you can exchange with your friends and peers so that you all get along and there's no real conversation of dissent and then you die and that's it, right? You know, so um, whereas with the OA and the other things we've talked about, they, they work in the way that cinema um, has worked for decades in that you enter into a world, you know, that you're held by the spell of of the filmmaker or the the TV maker, um, and that you you don't that you're left not unsatisfied, but you're you're not left um, with a sort of uh, easy resolution to anything, yeah. which you know should draw you back. Should actually make good business sense for somebody like Netflix that people would want to watch the OA over and over again, or 1899 over and over again, you know? Um, maybe that's why they don't make these things physical media, because then you wouldn't go back to the streaming service, right? But, I mean, if you think about, again, what Roland Bart had to say about rereading, you know, that rereading for decades was seen as being a sort of disgraceful pursuit and something you should never admit to doing, because, you know, it was... To be cranky and obsessive, and you know, it was really the sort of thing that was just for academics and old ladies and stuff like this, you know. And then, of course, with the the kind of mainstreaming of of things like Twin Peaks, that you need to watch over and over again, and the way that technology facilitates reviewing and rewatching, and you know, things are broken down into fragments and put onto YouTube and things like that, then that you would think that that actually would have made a sort of audience revolution where people were much more open to these type of experiences. Um, but again, you know, it it's a sort of disappointing, even depressing response to hear that kind of philistinism trotted out again, you know. Um, and what you were saying, Frank, about it being like 1984, I think, again, this is a sort of canonical idea that that you just memory hole all the things that don't fit into a kind of approved canon of what is good popular culture you know um what what is actually it's all a, a sort of exercise of taste <laughs> and the display of taste and in some ways this can be traced back to quentin tarantino you know that quentin tarantino displays his taste for things a lot of which are things that were considered as to be in bad taste, you know, um, which then become rediscovered and kind of mainstreamed. And Quentin Tarantino's podcast is fascinating, where you know he talks about um, his love of physical media, particularly video, having worked in a video store, um, and how you discover things, you know, how you you discover things that are not that would never been on your radar, you know, that are not. This is you know again the, the sort of experience that we all have when you go on a streamer it begins to recommend things to you you know the algorithms begin to work and it begins to try and like predict what you will like and netflix usually gets things hilariously wrong which is you know interesting in and of itself but that idea of discovery and the kind of um, risk taking that goes on with that that is something else that people seem very resistant to you know maybe it's the sort of sense of you know that's two hours out of my life that you'll never get back or something that's two hours you know come on so i think yeah that's kind of cultural thing which is disappointing to behold that it's happened and i don't think it'll last forever i think these things are probably quite cyclical 
you know, um, and maybe you know the, that stagnation will unintentionally stimulate some more sort of creative responses, um, which will be new and exciting for a while until you know they have the life sapped out them and and then the whole sort of thing starts again. So there's a very kind of cheerful response to your thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to me that a lot of what we're discussing is this idea of multiplicity that's really at the root of the OA multiple possibilities, multiple dimensions. Um, I'm thinking too about your book, you discuss a lot about the multiple genres that make up the OA and also the intertextuality that colors so much of the OA with all of these multiple resources that have fed and nourished the OA. And on one hand, a viewer doesn't necessarily need to know those, of course, you can appreciate it on many different levels. So again, I'm reminded of Donna Haraway saying that the future is plural. And I think that Brett Marling, Brett Marling may agree with that. I know she's a, a fan of, of Haraway. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about these multiple genres and multiple resources um, through intertextuality that one could perhaps gain an even greater appreciation of the OA. Um, if you could maybe send the, the listeners a few key resources that you think would maybe really deepen their relationship to the OA? Okay, sure. So I think when you, you're looking at the OA, um, <clears throat> the OA kind of is a bit of a trailblazer. Now we're all getting used to, you know, seeing mainstream movies about multiverses. You know, you had like Everything Everywhere All at Once and um, the Multiverse of Madness, the Doctor Strange film. But multiversal fiction has been around for a long time. And in the uh, book, I compare the OA to um, the work of Michael Moorcock, great British science fiction writer Michael Moorcock, um, who was very popular in the 70s, but is not very well known at all these days. Um, Philip K. Dick, you know, the, the Man in the High Castle, which was adapted to TV by Amazon. Um, and various other sort of texts that look at the idea of alternate, alternate realities or multiple realities. Um, this is a big thing in comic books. Um, uh, from the what's called the Silver Age of American superhero comics in the fifties, um, where you the the idea of there being two different Earths, Earth One and Earth Two, and that was an idea that was um, encouraged by uh, Julie Schwartz, who was the editor of uh, DC Comics at the time, and who had been H.P. Lovecraft's literary agent. So you know Lovecraft's ideas of um, not so much in multiverses, but of there being other presences in the universe that and maybe in different human beings, that comes into the OA. I think you can see an element of that there as well. Um, I think also with, um, is also the case with Sound of My Voice, they're drawn not just on kind of other books and movies, but also like from underground movements um, related to anarchism. So the one of the main sources for Sound of My Voice is um, the John Titor legend by Joseph Matheny, who designed one of the first alternate reality games called Ong's Hat, right? So the John Titor legend was about somebody who claimed to be a time traveller um, and who predicted the kind of collapse of the United States and so on. So it was like an internet prank. Joseph Matheny comes from an anarchist background, you know, as part of kind of American counterculture related to like Discordian anarchism, which is, of course, influenced by the situation at International. Um, you can see the influence of another um, alternate reality game called the Zhijun Institute on the OA. It's a major influence on the, the OA that they've never mentioned. Um, now, the Zhijun Institute was a real alternate reality game in San Francisco um, in the, uh, around 2013, which threatened to become a, a cult. And there's a, a sort of dramatised documentary about it called The Institute, um, which plays a lots of narrative games and it's all a huge influence on the OA. So I think what's remarkable about, about the makers of the OA is the extent of their knowledge of esoteric ideas, of cult fictions, of um, you know underground movements. And the multiplicities that you mentioned, well, I think this comes from you know, an, an awareness on both their behalfs that um, the kind of 
a heteronormative paradigms that we have in the culture are ultimately unhealthy for people, while at the same time not dismissing either traditional masculinity or traditional femininity, but playing with it. You know, in the way that Judith Butler encouraged people to play with it, you know, the way that more recently somebody like Paul B. Preciado has encouraged people to think about gender. Um, so the the idea of, of the multiplicity is, of course, itself, um, uh, as you say, unsettling for people. It's like this, you know, what what if I don't want to be multiple, right? You know, so instead what you get with the kind of uh, movies like... Uh, a very overrated film, my view, everything, everywhere, all at once, is an idea of like you know a very reduced sort of uh, diluted version of uh, Borges's idea of forking paths, which is another influence on the OA, you know, which we'd already seen in a movie like Sliding Doors, you know, romantic comedy Sliding Doors, and really what those kind of multiversal ideas are are just about regret, you know, that oh, if I'd done this. If I'd gone this, turned this corner, I might have met this man. If, you know, but if, if I'd missed this bus, I might have done, you know, and there's nothing that really kind of high stakes going on with them. Um, but what I think is great about the OA and its sort of idea of multiplicity is that it does destabilize that notion of which, you know, <clears throat> we kind of hoped it would have gone by now, but this kind of notion of, the stable self who uh, isn't really acted on by the cosmos, isn't really acted on by anything, you know, which is a sort of form of like homo economicus, you know, the kind of consuming individual who consumes the right thing, goes back to what we were saying earlier on. So if you engage with the OA and, and think about its, its presentation of different modes of being, on one hand, it's the kind of, there is a sort of simple alternative alternative version of Brit that we see in season two, which is what would have happened if she hadn't, you know, been taken to America, if her, her father hadn't died, if instead she'd become, you know, kind of wealthy and more sort of gregarious person. But even that is played with because, you know, there's she doesn't really want that. And there's the tension between her and the version of her that she kind of takes over. Um, so throughout, I think we're being asked to think about what it means to be me, what it means to be I, which is exactly what happened in the 90s with vertical comics like Doom Patrol and The Invisibles by Grant Morrison, uh, Pete Milligan's um, Shade the Changing Map. You know, these comics which were big influences on um, postmodern writers like Kathy Acker, um, who, of course... Introduced, I mean, Kathy Acker was a huge fan of Grant Morrison, you know, and Kathy Acker's you know, been, been subsequently a big influence on people like Judith Butler and, and Paul B. Preciado, you know, again, dealing with the notion of identity. There's a great book um, from the late 90s by Stephen Shaviro. I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Shaviro. He's an American academic um, who writes a lot about cinema and about popular culture. And Stephen wrote a book called Doom Patrols, which you can get online for free. Um, I'll send you a link later on, which is subtitled A Theoretical Fiction About Postmodernism. And throughout, he draws on Grant Morrison, Al Moore, various other figures from, from pop culture, Cindy Sherman, Andy Warhol. Um, he's the sort of anti-Jean Baudrillard. He's very opposed to Baudrillard's notion of postmodernism. And Kathy Acker is another big influence on him. So these these kind of like popular avant-garde, if you want to call them that, introduce a sort of troubling, destabilizing sense of self, which I think is absolutely healthy. You know, they they, they make you know they make you question who you are in the same way that Gnosticism does. You know, Gnosticism makes us think about what is the the real world, what is the real I that functions in this real world. You know, and the OA makes you, if you engage with the OA, it does the metaphysics of the world, of the universe, the multiverse of the OA. On one hand, you can take it purely as entertainment, sure, but you can also take it as a way of thinking about how reality is constructed, you know, sort of social construction of reality and how that relates to power. 
you know, how it relates to economic justice, how it relates to social justice generally, and how that that power flows, you know, as Foucault says, you know, power's never um never possessed, it's only ever exercised, right? And that the great the, the way that I became an academic was through things like reading those comics in the eighties and nineties and and the British music press used to be full of like uh, particularly continental philosophy and, and social theory applied to popular culture which is what the late, great Mark Fisher did with his book, you know, Capitalist Realism and Ghosts of My Life, you know. And, you know, Mark Fisher kind of insisted on um, a popular avant-garde, you know, that on one hand, a lot of the things that he loved and enjoyed were quite marginal and specialist and underground, but he he longed for a return to the to periods of like the post-punk era, or the rave era in the UK, the drum and bass music that came out of it, um, which was very popular and was in and of itself avant-garde and experimental. So it'd be interesting to see what Mark would have thought, you know, if he hadn't died, sadly, but in 2017, what he would have thought about something like the OE. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think this is what we're sort of longing for, uh, the three of us and a lot of other people, is for a a popular culture that doesn't insult your intelligence and a popular culture that kind of haunts you, you know, that that haunts you in a way that's much more than thinking about, oh, you know, what's going to happen in the next episode, but that gets under your skin and, um, but also that, that can be quite playful and, um, you know, beguiling in, in the way that it's playful, you know, um, which is something that Stephen Javiro talks about with, the, the postmodernism that he writes about in that book, Doom Patrol. You know, so, you know, certainly a huge influence on me was um, Grant Morrison's The Invisibles, which took a lot of underground and, um, you know, sort of esoteric ideas. But, but you know, the thing for, for Grant was always that these things had to be done in a popular way, you know, a way that, um, that was exciting, you know. But he didn't, but that's what he, uh, they rather means by pop. You know, that pop is something that is exciting and disorientating and disturbing and ecstatic. Um, not just that pop is something that's easy and, um, you know, actually it's far from that. The pop in and of itself is so exciting that it destabilises you. And The Invisibles was a huge influence on The Matrix, although they've never admitted to that either. Um, and, you know, The Matrix is another sort of exercise in diminishing returns. You know, the first Matrix film is great, the second one's sort of pretty good, and then the other two are not so fantastic after that. But you can't deny the kind of cultural impact that The Matrix had, you know, as a sort of Gnostic text, as something that... And again, the, the Wachowskis drew on a lot of different sources, um, you know, whether it be Baudrillard's theories um, or whether it be... Morrison's comics, or whether it be, you know, Philip K. Dick or whomever and whomever, you know. Um, so I think that's what's kind of missing is a sort of, or or what is, you know, there seems to be the threat of it disappearing is a pop culture that is ecstatically, disturbingly exciting and makes you think in in, in terms of these multiplicity. And and what would you say? according to you, is the, the central theme of the OA? I know it's uh, almost impossible to answer such a question, especially for a show that was cancelled after only two seasons, when five were uh, prepared. Um, but if there was one central element, uh, in your opinion, which one would that be? I think the central theme of the OA is, what is the central theme of the OA? Right? You know, I think it's that kind of ludic sort of thing. I, I think really, if to to simplify it and to dilute it, it, would be like what is reality, you know, which sounds like a bit of an old chestnut, but you know, um, because you're constantly, particularly at the end of the second season, which is quite heavily influenced by, or at least seems to be influenced by David Lynch's Inland Empire, you know, where the the carpet is completely pulled out from under you, right? You know, now <clears throat> not the first, as I point out in the book, not the first time that this has happened, Inland Empire obviously, but there's other, there's an episode of the Twilight Zone that, that does that. But what you 
once you start thinking about okay, what is reality? No, now this can lead you to you know the Gnostics or to mystics from all different types of religions. Um, what is the it can lead you to Samuel Beckett, who I talk about in the book, to the Beckett trilogy. All these kind of senses of um, the notion of artifice and thereof, therefore of an artificia, you know, some what is the creative force, you know. Now you can call that God or you can consider that God is a, a way of approaching what it is, you know, like St. An Anselm's, like, you know, idea of the ever receding ontological ceiling that you never get close to God. You only ever approach God, you can never fully achieve God, but that's the point. Right, so I think this is what it is with the OAs. Like, what is real? Um, and then there's the sort of sense that everything's real. You know that, that then for you just have to understand what something is in and of itself. You know, um, which is again not new, but I think the way that it was delivered was new, and um, you know, it was really um, really engaging compared to like other similar shows that were on television. I mean just it's not a simple like reduction of like, you know, here's here's the reality, here's the simulation. You know, which I think has there's so much of that around at the moment. I mean even that Harry Styles film that was out recently deals with that. But, you know, I, I mean Bojar said that the, the Wachowski's completely misunderstood his ideas of hyper reality. You know, by presenting a, a simulation then a kind of crude reality that that is actually superior to the simulation and which was that's nonsense right you know you just need to understand the reality of the simulation um and that's i think what what's going on in the OA. i think you know with mark fisher's um great kind of uh analysis of inland empire you know when he talks about a kind of world hemorrhaging that goes on in Inland Empire is fascinating because there's no hierarchy of worlds in Inland Empire. They're all equally real, right? And that's that's where I think the OE was going. Like, you know, there's the, the two universes that we have, season one, season two, are equally real. And then there seems to be a superior universe, which is the universe that's introduced at the end of season two, but I do, I deeply doubt that they would have gone down that path because it's too simple, you know. Um, you know, instead you have, and again, this happens in comic books all the time. Superhero comics are used to the, the great um, sort of periods of experimentation in those comic books, where and Grant Morrison's one of the persons, one of the people who does that the most, where you have the idea that that all these realities are all equally real, that they all exist sometimes harmoniously with each other, sometimes in discord with each other, but that nothing can be dismissed as less real than anything else. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that in terms of, um, well, social justice, you know, you know, if you think about it in terms of, uh, at the moment, the, the discussion about trans um, issues, um, which is very heated in the UK, Scotland has, you know, Scottish government has passed one bill that the Westminster government is trying to block and so on, you know. So, but what, you know, great kind of gender theorists like Teresa de Loretis or, or um, Paul Preciado talk about is this idea that there there is a bunch of people who think that their gender is real and that other people's gender isn't real, right? You know, and therefore what they're saying is that their gender is better than everybody else's gender and so on. So, and you can see how that applies to things like not just gender, but social class, how it applies to race, you know, the idea that one thing is real. And, you know, to kind of engage with multiplicities in that sense is to get closer to what, what the world is really like, rather than having an attempt to say that, okay, well, you know, maybe um, white heteronormativity is real and everything else is just a version of that that's not really as real as real health and normativity, that sort of thing. Now, you might say that that's reading too much into the OA, but that's the point of things like the OA. And I don't actually don't think that is reading too much into the OA because I think that's exactly what they wanted to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think in the same way that 
and those great vertical comics by people like Milligan and Morrison um, and Alan Moore's work, which inspired them, was to, you know, in its own way, agitate for a wider definition of what is real, you know, and what is, you know, to get rid of the notion of the natural, to understand that natural is a social construct, you know, that um, benefits a certain privileged group of people. It's interesting that you bring that up because it's a discussion that Frank and I were having recently um, regarding the fact that I suppose um, in the immediate sense, what really what we love so much about the OA is this kind of very rich, imaginative, multi-layering. But the fact that there is this very contemporary social commentary that is running throughout the OA and is so beautifully integrated into the storytelling. And we have really, I think, very respectful representations of the transgender, of disability representation, among others. Um religious and racial tensions also particularly in season two that come to the fore um but what i love is this kind of ode to the imagination to the rich inner life and to respect that is something equally real and something that unites all of us that transcends all of these different forms of of identity and once again it goes back to the power of fiction and to the power of storytelling mm -hmm. which is uh, um able to create uh, elements that uh, gain an ontological weight that can change and modify our reality. I mean, um, for instance, Sherlock Holmes uh, is fictional, but he's also real. I mean, he is he is real. Uh, I mean, people there are probably more people in the world who know his name than the name of um, the French president. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, it has an impact on the world. Our ideas, our fictions, our storytelling can really um, change things and can really help make a better world. Well, there's a lot of discussion in sort of esoteric circles at the moment about the imaginal. You know, and that phrase has been used a lot. And about the importance of protecting the imaginal from um, it's like corporate intrusion, you know, that the um, imagination has not been given much room to manoeuvre because of this constant barrage of content, you know, um, that that's threatened to create a kind of sort of monoculture. And Disney is the 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 example that's always kind of dragged out. Now, fair enough. I mean, you know, Disney are trying to dominate all time and all space, which is what you would expect from Disney. But um, they're also in a situation where their characters are they're desperately trying to hold on to characters like Mickey Mouse and so on who are entering into the public domain, you know, which they don't want to happen because they want to have this control over them. And this is the, you know, this is the, the thing that's going on in the OA is like, one thing I think it's really easily to overlook in the OA, or, but I think you notice nevertheless, is just how depleted the Crestwood suburb is. You know, you, the, all these, the, the fact that they gather in an unfinished house, you know, a house that's been built, but un, uncompleted, but not completed because of the financial crisis, it seems, of, of 2008, right? And the empty lives of um, not just her, the tribe that she gathers, but it seems of everybody in Crestwood that, that, the, um, that it, it is a, a representation of America, of a depleted America, where, you know, people just, you know, survive rather than live. And uh, there is no... Sorry, Frank, can you go? No, I, and, and I was just thinking that this really echoes uh, Rancho Rosa in Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, you know, what, what you've got is, you know, this sense that something has gone from the culture. And um, so interesting sort of, like, people involved in kind of magical practice and esoteric thought, like particularly Gordon White, who does the Rune Soup podcast, which I highly recommend, is who you know comes from a marketing background and an economics background, talks about magic and esoteric practice in relation to capitalism. Right? You know, and this idea of capitalism as as um creating as Marx said, a false consciousness. You know, and a, a false consciousness that um affects everyone, not just the people at the bottom, you know, it affects everyone where they, they believe that capitalism, they come to believe that capitalism is 
inevitable and irreplaceable and so on. Um, and of course, Marx inspires Guy Debord and the situationists who, um, you know, Guy Debord talks about a false consciousness of time. Um, now, I didn't actually write much, I think, at all even about the situationists in the book about the OA, although I have talked about them in relation to it in a few lectures that I've given since. But the idea in the, um, you know, this from the Situations International of living directly, of recovering a lost engagement with the world is is echoed in the OA. And, and the you know, the kind of Joseph Campbell-esque sort of, you know, heroic quest, the call to adventure, right, which Britt Marlin has spoken about has been something very important, particularly for boys, um, you know, and of course you've got a, a trans male character in there who is probably the most heroic figure in the OA, and, you know, the person who's the purest of heart, you know, and, and her song is sort of follow. So, the, you know, the, the notion of adventure, of um, actively living, if you look at, you know, the, the parents in Crestwood, they're all, you know, dysfunctional. Um, if you look at the houses, they, they're all, you know, her, you know, instruction to people, leave your door open, you know, challenging this idea of a kind of suburban mutual isolation, which is already there in Sound of My Voice. And people like Gordon White, you know, people in, in the, the kind of magical world, the esoteric world, are talking about this attempt to rescue the imaginal and to discover this kind of spark or rediscover the spark within you, within culture, that is being you know, suppressed by economics, but also by um, cultural production, which is driven by economics, you know, and not driven by a kind of spirit of adventure. So, and also I think that goes back to the idea of multiplicity, you know, of, um, you know, of not um, growing up too soon in the sense of, uh, you know, mapping out your life in a very kind of precise way, which of course is very difficult to do these days anyway you know, given how precarious things are. So, you know, I work at Glasgow School of Art. I've also a graduate of Glasgow School of Art as well as Glasgow University. And Glasgow, Glasgow School of Art, I work in the design school in the Department of um, Design, Theory and History. And, you know, our students are really fascinating because the way that they, they are preparing themselves to deal with such an uncertain world you know, in terms of employment and of housing, particularly, which is a real issue in the UK. Um, these very kind of passionate, engaged, you know, skilled, uh, imaginative students are, you know, kind of gearing up to go out into the world, a world which, um, I mean, unfortunate thing that's happening in, not so much in Scotland, but in, um, in England uh, with the Westminster government is the complete um, diminution of the humanities. You know, an idea um, already throughout England, universities are shutting down their, their arts and humanities departments. I don't know if that's happening in France as well. I hope not. France is a bit more sensible, right? You know, yeah. and you've got you've got our most recent Prime Minister, there seems to be a new one every 10 minutes, but, you know, saying that his plan is for for, student, for high school pupils to, to be forced to do maths until they're 18. You know, and he doesn't mean maths, he means arithmetic, right? You know, but because this is the idea of, of people being employable and it's such a defeatist craving attitude to take, you know, given, you know, that Britain relies and has relied so much on its soft power, on its cultural production, you know, that seems to be like, you know, sort of such a backward step, such a, an, a strangely kind of anti-British thing to do, you know, to, to just say, well, all the kind of things that make Britain unique um, can just be gone by the wayside. You know, so I think it becomes very important, again, to go back to this idea of being bold, being bold in in the things that you both produce and consume, you know, that, and, you know, to mention Bart again, you know, Bart's idea of a text of, of pleasure rather than a text of ecstasy, you know, that but but what Bart also says is that, that you know anything can be read as a text of pleasure if you don't engage with it. You know, if if you just um you know have a very kind of passive uh, participation in it. And I think what's happening with this emphasis on content 
um, is that you know your your producers, your streaming services, want to churn out texts of pleasure, and pleasure in the most sort of you know kind of diluted, dismal, um, calorie empty calorie version of of pleasure that you can imagine, and I, this is typical of the kind of short term views that. Um, that streamers take and government seem to take these days that they don't think about what the long term um, costs of this kind of like cultural diminution are going to be. You know, what might happen though in the UK is that um, if there is, I mean, it won't happen in Scotland. Scotland's not going to surrender to this idea that you know you just Scotland needs its soft power very much, but. Um, that if you just sort of churn out a you know, nation of accountants or whatever, that it won't appeal to people, and maybe that will create a new underground. People are angry in the UK. People are angry in England, um, particularly about the way that you know they've been misruled for the past twelve years. So you know, I'm always optimistic about these things because otherwise you would get a bed in the morning. But you know. I'm seeing this like, through all the different areas of interest that I have. There is this sort of, again, a sort of call to action, like to not just settle for, you know, watching television, becoming a couch potato, or binge watching or any of this sort of thing, but becoming more um, engaged. And I'm and deeply moved by the way that my students have responded to um, the precarious world that they face with a sense of boldness about you know rather than just this kind of defeatist depressive idea the fact that people are still coming to art schools you know um i always say to my students when you said that you were going to go to art school how many people tried to discourage you and of course just about every one of them says yeah you know you, you will hear that i mean it's slightly different in the design school um than it is in the fine art school but you know um so, yeah, you know, I think this is things like the OA, and again, maybe this is to give them too much importance, although I don't think so. Um, things like the OA, you know, they're sort of beacons in the same way that Brett Marlin talked about, you know, um, Octavia Butler being a beacon for her, you know, of, of saying that things don't have, you don't have to be Bikini Girl number three, you don't have to be, you know, um, you don't have to go and do a sort of vocational degree you don't have to like experience just the sort of empty pleasure of consumerism but you can instead you know have a sort of more invigorating de destabilizing for sure but you know ultimately more rewarding life um i mean you know i've heard it all my life i've never had a proper job i've either worked in the arts of being a writer or you know being an academic and a writer now you know so um that people well-meaningly maybe will say to you, did you ever think about doing something more vocational? But that, even that kind of well-meaning approach is a sort of expression of fear, right? You know, um, of fear of, of um, well, of the unknown, which is what fear is always about really, isn't it? So, um, yeah, and again, this is the kind of, the power of the OA, and I, I see it with some of the, the, the fans that I've engaged with when they're not shouting at me for having overinterpreted the book, uh, overinterpreted the series, <laughs> which uh, I got a very long email from somebody complaining about that, uh, and that I got it wrong. That I got it wrong as well. But I, I'm there's there's a new OZ, OA zine being launched, and I'm recording an interview for that in a couple of weeks. Um, it seems to have really touched a lot of people. Um, it also helped a lot of people get through the lockdowns. You know, the OA fans' response to that was very moving, using the dance moves as a way of, one, staying fit and active, but also of kind of bonding with each other over Zoom, people doing these kind of dances and things. Mm. So I think, it, it, you know, it's it's not coming back. We just have to accept that. But I think that it's, over time, I think um, it's uh, it'll become recognised for for being a very important um, piece of pop culture, you know, a very important piece of popular avant-garde of experimental narrative. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who's a casual away from, you know, people are either really committed to it or 
they just don't get it and don't want to pretend it doesn't exist or get really angry about it and go on. It requires an investment. <laughs> yeah. On the yeah, and, and thank goodness that we do appreciate this show that's so much about inner life because I think that despite the fact that all of us would have appreciated seeing the five seasons and allowing the creative team to really follow through with their vision, I think that it's also really interesting that we're left with two seasons that were really fantastic, that have left an important mark on all of us. And I think that uh, we fans can sort of imagine our own ending. I don't know if you've done this, if you've ever sort of imagined your own follow through for the OA, but I often like to think about these different seasons. Uh, not really. Um, I mean, I've kind of got an idea. I've got my own idea of what was going to happen next. Hmm. Um, but I think what would have been interesting, I, I think that the OA is directly responsible for movies like Everything Everywhere All at Once. Right. You know, I think, not, not that it's the only influence on it, but I think that it was a kind of trailblazer in, in creating this sort of interest in, in multiversal text and so on. But I think that if they had continued to produce the OE in a kind of genre climate where there was more multiversal production going on, I think they would have really had to like challenge what was becoming sort of orthodoxy and and mm. That type of um, that kind of subgenre, you know, and I think they would have found a way to do it. But what fascinated me was with how bold that move was at the end of the second season, you know, to where it seems that Prairie is ascending to this kind of godhood, mm -hmm. and then she crash lands in another universe, and um, you know, the, the Kareem Washington, the private investigator, is a great character. Um, his look of utter awe in the religious sense, mm -hmm. as he watch, as he realizes that he's a character in a drama, you know. And then, as when he calls um, Buck, you know, the um, the the version of Buck too, you know, and the religious look of religious awe on his face as well. It's so powerful that you know this is beyond just the kind of like. Um, you know, identity switching that goes on in, say, Doctor Who or something like that. And I think this is where it was getting really seriously Gnostic. Mm -hmm. You know, that, um, you know, in Gnostic thought, you know, the, the idea of Sophia coming to kind of liberate her people of, and, and also, you know, the demigod that she has created and so on. So I think it would have got, you know, kind of seriously uh, Gnostic and psychedelic, hopefully, you know. But I don't think there would... I would have been deeply disappointed if it had ever ended on a definitive note. You know, I think that they would have, I think once you open that door, you open another door and another door. And I think um, that's, um, you know, that's what they would have done. But the satirical element of um, the OA is also really important. You know, having a character in the second season who's based on Elon Musk, you know, and other kind of tech billionaires, and who's, of course, like, it's an utter bastard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, their response to the world around them, I think, would also have deeply informed it. And, you know, with Brett Marlin becoming friends with uh, Naomi Klein and doing the, you know, the narration for the audiobook, uh, not Shot Doctrine, but I think maybe it was Shot Doctrine, or maybe it was the one after that, and becoming more vocally political. Um, I'd be interested to see how, I'd be interested to see what she's going to do anyway, but how that would have found its way into, um, into the OE. Because I don't think that, that Brit Marlin is, and I hate using this phrase, but woke. Right. I mean, I don't think that she fashionably displays um, opinions that are kind of quite vague about social justice. I think she she understands the importance of inclusion for everyone. And that's why I think, you know, her statements, you know, the things that she said about um, a feminism that benefits young men are so important, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, to go back to what was said earlier on, but, you know, somebody like Andrew Tate, like this evil figure like Andrew Tate, you know, I think he would have been the kind of person that they would have satirised mm -hmm. in the show. You know, that um, that rise of a kind of ultra-masculinity ultra of, which is just 
misogyny. I think they would have dealt with that. But there was so much going on. I mean, they'd already done that with the character of Stephen, you know, who goes from being that kind of high school bully um, to being somebody who's you know, becoming much more dynamic a person and much more not tolerant a person. It's because tolerance is always a very kind of weak way of, you know, accepting difference. Um, but yeah, I think that they w- they would have very much had their finger on the pulse of what was happening culturally, and I'd love to have seen that as a response to you know, the rise of of um, say something like you know the fashionability of traditional Catholicism. <laughs> you know, I mean, how they would have responded to something like that, or the um, things like. Um, you know, kind of Bitcoin and stuff, like, which they were already dealing with. I think they would have dealt with that very well. And I think they would also have under- had something to say about fandom, you know. Um, I think, you know, Brett Marlon particularly has very, been very gracious with their fans and very kind of accessible to them. But, you know, taking back to what we were talking about at the start, I think she's aware of the responsibility that comes with having a fan base. Um and a fan base that is looking at a charismatic figure, you know, that if you are a charismatic figure and she is, then that confers a great responsibility. I think we are reaching the end of this uh, uh, episode of uh, After Images. Uh, thank you very much, David Sweeney, for having joined us for uh, this discussion about the OA. Yeah. Thank you so much. We really appreciated hearing from you. And we hope that listeners will check out your book, The OA, in Constellations um, sci-fi series. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media. Uh-huh.